Ms. Ann Kelly, and I'm excited to introduce you to our four speakers today. Jim Kane, Director of Consulting Services at CGI, Michael Magu, Director, Consulting Expert at CGI, Simon Trussler, Director at INO, and Jim Morris, a Senior Information Scientist here at SmartLogic. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is in broadcast mode, which means all of you are muted. We have about 45 minutes worth of content, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end of the broadcast. If you have a question, please enter it in the question panel on the, of the GoToWebinar uh, platform, and you'll see that on the right-hand side of your screen. And finally, this broadcast is being recorded. Replay information will be sent to all registrants one day following the webinar. Before I turn things over um, to the panel, I want to do a little level set. So today you'll be hearing about and seeing some demos of SmartLogic's semantic platform. So what is Semaphore? In a nutshell, Semaphore is SmartLogic's semantic AI platform. It allows organizations to reveal and extract critical knowledge from their structured and unstructured information to gain business insight. And it starts with a model. Semaphore allows you to build, manage, and govern semantic models. The model is then published and used in a classification process to enrich information assets with metadata, extract critical facts and relationships that can be used in further processing, and harmonizes disparate data sources for unified access. Organizations then can take that semantically enriched information that Semaphore creates and apply them to their critical business initiatives. Some examples might be they can leverage the model to support investigative analytics. They can automate manual processes, whether it's a, a SharePoint workflow or integrate with a robotic process automation platform. And they can drive contextual metadata-driven search to improve the customer experience. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of uh, Simon Michael and Jim Morris and myself, welcome everybody. Good morning or good afternoon. We're here today because we all have massive amounts of content to deal with, whether it's in, in systems, whether it's in file shares, whether it's in SharePoint, whether it's in other applications. We know we're overwhelmed with this stuff and it's difficult to make sense of it. Well, this presentation is going to focus on ways to release that knowledge and that content and to make it contextual and available and findable and more. We're going to look at this from two levels. One, we're going to talk a little bit about what a taxonomy is or a semantic model. And two, we're going to provide eight examples or use cases and some demonstrations to say, what can you do if you have this knowledge and you can get to it and make sense of it? So Simon, Michael, Jim Morris are going to provide information and actual demonstrations. And there's going to be eight uh, examples that we're going to give. But before we get there, let's talk just a little bit about what we mean by a semantic framework or, or a taxonomy. Think about documents. They sit in a file share application, but let's use file shares or even SharePoint. And what do we know about them? Typically, all we know about this content is that there's a file name, and in some cases, it sits in a folder, which sits in a folder, which sits in a folder, which sits in a folder. So we know folder names, or maybe we know a create by date. But really, other than that, we don't know anything about it. A search engine can look at it and do a text query against it. But really, that doesn't get to the heart of things, because all it's looking is a specific text or, or sequence of words. What we're really going to do is try to demonstrate through this how, if you enhance that with what we call a semantic network, a semantic framework, we can make content smart. So you've heard of the term taxonomy in SharePoint. You think about that as columns that you choose to apply to a term. In a file share, maybe like I said, you're looking at folder names. What we're going to do is we're going to explain a little bit more about the semantic framework, and then we're going to get into these examples and say, what can you do with that semantic framework? So again, when you have a good taxonomy, when you have classification tools, you can go into content and you can build you know, term-driven sites, essentially dynamic content coming into the sites that's driven in there through the use of the search engine and through the use of the semantic model, which can include a taxonomy and an ontology and other things. We can, we're gonna, you can demonstrate more advanced ways to use search engines more effectively. 
You can go into unstructured repositories using this and you can find, put structure to that and move it into structured content repositories. Once it's in there, now you have contextual based views, role based views, ways to surface content because now the content is smart. And you can even leverage chatbots and other things. So I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Simon right now to discuss a little bit about what a taxonomy is. So Simon, could you please uh, uh, explain to folks w what we mean by that? Yeah, so as Jim referred to these kind of two key platforms for doing more uh, with your knowledge management, one is the enhanced taxonomy and one is the auto classification and natural language processing. So let's just talk about those two. Uh, when we talk about a taxonomy, we're talking a bit beyond uh, the, the, the kind of basics that you might be familiar with. You're, you're all familiar with the, the categorization of content, like when you go into a supermarket and you look at the different aisles and different types of produce and products and things like that. So that's kind of in, in your head a basic taxonomy and it could be just a, in, a, in terms of a, an enterprise system, it could be just a drop down menu of categories of content or key topics. Uh, in a full taxonomy, it's a bit more than that, uh, and it might have some semantic uh, uh, categorization built into it. Taking that a bit further, as we go from right to left here, uh, adding a thesaurus capability where you're adding more about synonyms, acronyms, different ways of spelling the term, variants of the term, and associative relationships where you're looking laterally across a taxonomy to say this branches relate to this term and this branch is related to this term and another branch. So that's sort of enriching it still further. And then the ultimate here is to go to an ontology or a graph database. Um, an ontology can be a confusing term because it's used in all sorts of ways. So sometimes we prefer the term enhanced taxonomy or enhanced semantic model. And in this case, you're, you're taking some of the stuff we talked about previously and putting even more of a structure around it to define different types of relationships, different types of concept and relationships between them. So Simon, things like uh, diabetes is to pancreatitis is to type one to type two is to insulin and so forth. And that, yeah. that ontology and the power of something like smart logic allows us to place values on the relationships so that as it looks at raw content, it can determine what the appropriate uh, uh, terms are that describe that, correct? Yeah, and you might move, you might have a relationship between your diabetes content and your nutrition content or your uh, your cardiac content because they're all related to each other and people might want to leap from one to the other. So, so um, both hierarchical and lateral. The, these but, uh, are the things that bring that, bring that content to life. So let's talk a little bit about natural language processing and how it ties into this. Yeah, that's the other key platform we're talking about is uh, natural language processing and kind of its cousin is auto classification. So um, automatically looking at content and extracting the meaning of that content and then using it to tag terms according to the taxonomy. So um, that's the other piece of this. Of course, you can do this manually and people did do it manually until recently, but uh, as repositories get bigger and taxonomies get, get bigger, you face a scalability challenge. So um, NLP really helps with scaling things up. And there's all sorts of buzzwords you see here that rely on this technology. So fact extraction, sentiment analysis, a varieties of extraction, different kinds of search and chatbots we'll talk about later on, voice we'll talk about later on, uh, and then automatic categorization, translation, uh, because taxonomies can be multilingual. And then summarization and uh, generation of content uh, based um, both on the taxonomy and on the text analysis itself. So there's a lot of um, capabilities that this technology opens up for us. And uh, we'll talk about the concrete applications of those on the next few slides. Yeah, so really with, with the correct semantic model, call it a taxonomy if you want, but a semantic model underlying your, 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 your basic, your approach to this now, Let's move from the kind of theoretical to the practical and talk about use cases. Yeah, so in a way, the subtitle of our presentation could be eight great things you can do with a well-developed semantic model or a well-developed taxonomy. And that's the uh, eight things we have here. I'm sure there are more as well, but we chose these eight to highlight. 
and we've subdivided them into these three groups. So one, two, and three on the left are about enhancing your search experience. Uh, we're talking search within an organization or an intranet uh, by improving the relevancy of results, by creating custom search applications that focus just on particular slices of the knowledge repositories and also by guiding users um, through widgets and search assistance techniques to find what they want more accurately or find things they didn't even realize they wanted but um, but but uh, find out they do when they're guided that way. Second group is knowledge discovery, taking that a bit further where we'll look first of all at the power of visualization for finding related topics and for basically intelligently expanding the scope of your search in directions you might not initially have thought about. Then in number five, we'll look at how we can present snapshots of what the organization knows about a particular topic uh, using automated term-driven pages. Uh, and finally, in number six, we'll look at how taxonomy helps to provide new, new user experiences. We talked about that a second ago, and chat and voice search are growing techniques for making search more intuitive and more user-friendly. And both of them are very much underpinned by taxonomy and order classification. Finally, Jim Morris will guide us through a couple of examples of knowledge extraction and workflow, which is taking this to the, the ultimate, where you're, you're, you're actually extracting new knowledge and summarizing new knowledge from your data and your documents, and also pushing it to the right people at the right time through, through workflows. So on the next slide, um, Let's start with uh, search relevance ranking number one. So um, a couple of points to, to make about this uh, on the left-hand side. Um, despite all the advances in technology in recent years, we still get complaints all the time when we talk to our clients. People still have difficulty finding what they want in internal repositories. That's the constant complaint is there's too many irrelevant results and uh, I end up just emailing stuff to people because it's too hard to find it on the system. And in a way the bar keeps getting raised on this because users naturally compare what they're doing inside the organization with what they see outside and in Google searches. You know, when, it, when we do a, a Google search for a technical problem we're having in, a, in IT for instance, you typically get straight to, the, what, to what you need in the first two or three results and uh, it's been hard to replicate that historically in enterprise search. So on the left, um, out of the box enterprise search really is mostly still based on full text string based searching as Jim was discussing up front and it's looking for word matches in the title and the body of documents and th that really underweights both the value of document metadata and, and also specific facts like for instance product references in the document that, that wouldn't have been picked up necessarily or the meaning wouldn't have been picked up necessarily by a pure text search. And then on the right, in, in SharePoint specifically, which after all most of us use for enterprise content management, uh, out of the box, SharePoint does not actually uh, uh, work with taxonomy tags in its relevance ranking. Uh, it ignores them. So you actually have to go in and fix that uh, if you want to have your taxonomy tags and other kinds of metadata referenced uh, in the relevance ranking. So on the bottom there, there's a screenshot from the screen that helps you do this in the SharePoint admin and as you can see it, it weights the title more heavily than the file name and the body and your taxonomy probably should be somewhere in the middle of that perhaps under title uh, or perhaps even ahead of title if you're very comfortable. Now you're going to see later that, that SharePoint because the, the, the semantic model and some of the tools allow us to auto categorize SharePoint content so now the search engine's working against tags that are more sm are smarter against that document than, than the doc than just the full text query. Exactly. So you want to take advantage of that and, and you do have to, to do that manually. It's, it's not done out of the box. Second um, thing here is custom search apps for more focused retrieval. So again, one, one complaint about enterprise search is there's too much there. And when, when I go to the advanced search page, there's, there's dozens of drop-down boxes and, and fields I can use. So can you simplify things a bit for me? Um, and here's an example where we're, we're doing a more focused search for a particular use case, in this case, um, automotive maintenance data, where there's, uh, we've zoomed in here on just three 
search verticals, so three kinds of content, and this is leveraging the content type part of the taxonomy, issue records, procedures, and user manuals. So we're just, we're just zooming in on those three types, and then we're refining that just by vehicle type and by issue type, but there's probably lots of other facets we could have used, but we're keeping just to those two to, to keep it really focused on the use case. Final thing here is you might customize the display template for the results in the middle of the page just to narrow that down to just the fields you really want to see. So stuff you can do like that in, in SharePoint with some, some scripting and some configuration would uh, kind of simplify and declutter the, um, the search experience for, for users. What, you know, it's interesting what you're saying is dynamically generated content. So a user, I may go in and, and somebody else may go in 10 minutes later and because new content has been added, we may see different things here. And that user content, that, that content is dynamically generated through the search engine, which is taken advantage of the semantic model. So you may surface things that don't, that aren't part of a keyword uh, full text because of that. You're going to surface it off the metadata or, or med metadata relationships, which is very powerful. Right. Next, I just want to introduce Jim's, uh, Jim Morris's first demo uh, by looking at search enrichment. This is about helping to guide users because uh, when their initial search string isn't getting them exactly what they want. So, so most of us are not trained librarians and we may not be very good at formulating exactly the right search terms or the right Boolean logic to get what we need. But we can leverage taxonomy to point us in the right direction. And here's a bunch of tools, um, in this case from Semaphore, uh, that uh, point you in the right direction. So. Um, Starting on the left here, a couple of tools for browsing the taxonomy to find the right, the right search categories. So if you just want to browse rather than search, you have a, a tree browser and an A to Z browser, which are familiar kind of concepts from the external web. Then on the top and the top right, there's some tools that take your initial search text and suggest terminology that, that based on querying the taxonomy in real time. So in this case, uh, the, the um, we're looking at the, the term moon buggy, and Jim will show you this in, in a live setting uh, and synonyms for that from the taxonomy. Uh, and then um, finally, uh, on the bottom right, the uh, pop up uh, definitions. So uh, taxonomy terms can have definitions attached to them or even pictures, as in this case, uh, which again would give you sometimes what you need without actually drilling into the results. Maybe you just want a quick summary of the term, and that would be a good way to do that as well. On the bottom left is a visualization widget, and we'll go to the next slide to, to look a bit more at that. And again, I'll just talk briefly because Jim's going to demo this for you. Uh, but essentially what you're doing here is taking a topic that people have searched for. In this case, Apollo 11 might be the search term. And the visualizer is showing you all of the concepts in the taxonomy or in the semantic model that relate to Apollo 11. So on the top right, there's who it was crewed by, on the bottom right, there's uh, the, the, the spacecraft that were part of the mission, there's the launch vehicle, there's the launch location, and so on. So all of these things are really helping you navigate that knowledge graph or that semantic model that you created earlier on and helping people find things they may not have thought they needed. So when they were searching for Apollo 11, maybe they were really wanting things on the command module or on one of the astronauts. And, this would guide them to a more specific search. So let you know, me pass it. Oh, sorry, well, Jim. But, yeah, before we pass it over, if you think about this, think about drug manufacturing or, or R&D, where um, a scientist, and this has been very popular in, this, in the scientist's use case, uses this to start browsing through the body of data around, uh, or browsing through the topics that will then lead to a body of data and they're looking for things, but they don't know exactly what they're looking for. And they're going to find the relationships of maybe this drug to another drug and another phase or another stage or another element of manufacturing and surface that content up that they would never find with a search engine. So, so in, uh, a way, it, in a way, it's, like, it's like a more sophisticated uh, did you mean function, yeah. which, you've all, which you've all seen under Google. It's a more sophisticated version of that. Much so let more, me pass, let's pass yeah. it to Jim Morris, who will actually show us this in action. Thank you, Jim and Simon. And uh, that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to take some of those examples and the idea of improving and uh, enhancing a search experience. 
uh, with, a, uh, with a taxonomy uh, managed in semaphore. And the real message is that these taxonomies are so valuable and can be used in so many different contexts. And search is, is one of those uh, contexts. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, jump in and just show you the semaphore model itself. We're looking at the semaphore dashboard here where I might have any number of, of uh, taxonomy or ontological models uh, that I'm uh, managing for different use cases or different departments, et cetera. And these can all be- And this is an administrative areas. dashboard. And a typical end this, user wouldn't see this, right? Yes, thank you, Jim. Good for pointing that out. Uh, this is for an administrator. So this is a, somebody managing a taxonomy would be looking at these views. So I just wanted to show you the taxonomy very quickly here. The example we're using, as Simon introduced, is, is about uh, the Apollo missions, which is very popular uh, these days. And I can quickly uh, just bring up a particular concept here. And you can see there's a lot of rich information about uh, these concepts. Uh, I can um, present uh, additional information from other sources so that the, the person managing this taxonomy has everything they need in order to uh, 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 manage this effectively. It's a, it's a great tool to, to use. So that's all I'm going to spend in there because we want to focus on the end user's experience. So how do we make use of this taxonomy? Uh, just building it is is not uh, enough. So let's look at a search uh, example. Um, so if we stick with that moon buggy concept, this is this is a repository. It's based on a project we did for uh, we did with NASA, um, but it's our own our own data. But imagine you've got a whole host of engineering documents. Uh, that are written by engineers, uh, and you're trying to make that information available to the public, and the public doesn't know, uh, you know, uh, 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 space engineering. Uh, they know the terms they hear in the media, like like moon buggy. So if I wanted to find something about uh, the moon buggy, I could just do a quick search, and we get a lot of results. But you know, we're, these moon buggy is not a term used in uh, in official, you know, engineering uh, documents. So we're not finding much if we're just doing a general search. And we might think of being, getting clever and saying, well, let's put it in quotes because I'm looking for a specific string moon buggy. Well, then I get very few. And why is that? Well, for the same reason. It's, there's only a few documents in, uh, in, in this repository that mention that. So that's the problem with just looking for strings, you know, instead of uh, concepts. And you, applying a taxonomy allows you to introduce that idea of searching for what the person actually means, not what they're explicitly asking for. So this time I'll, I'll just pause for a second and we'll see moon buggy drops down and, and it, it's, it's redirecting uh, to a concept. And when, we're, and when we search on the concept as opposed to the string, then we find a nice healthy uh, result set with high recall and high precision. And uh, uh, you can see that it's the, the lunar roving vehicles referred to in many different ways. And that's what the taxonomy is managing. So that's just the one concept that we're dealing with. But the, the idea is all the other rich information you can introduce into a search experience from the taxonomy. For example, we have relationships to other missions. So I can do a lateral search. Well, maybe I'm interested in something a little more broader than just uh, the lunar roving vehicle, I can look at Apollo 15. So I'm getting information that I can use straight from the taxonomy. And I can see like a great, great, uh, like a fingerprint of the Apollo 15 concept here, the crew members, the vehicles, uh, et cetera. And if I hover over them, I can bring in information from uh, the taxonomy giving descriptive information. Uh, one other thing we have here are these facets on the left-hand side, these filters. These filters are not just randomly created based on uh, information from the results set. They're actually organized by the facets that we've designed in the taxonomy so that users uh, get filters that are presented in a more meaningful way. And it uh, builds, another, it yeah, builds. go ahead dynamically based on the tags that it's seeing in the content. We've seen this in SharePoint as well when you do this, so that when you do the search, the, the facets are generated from the content itself. So you're not going to hit anything in a facet that's taking you to a blank, blank page or no content. 
Yeah, yeah. It's a really good point because yeah, the, the, the idea is, and this is what we do with SharePoint all the time, is SharePoint is a great tool, but it needs metadata. So how do you create that metadata so that it can, so SharePoint can do what it is designed to do, like create these facets um, and to create dynamic information spaces, which I think we'll talk about in the next uh, section. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show everybody was just look at that visualizer a little more closely. Uh, again, we're looking at a very similar model. I can find the same type of concepts, but this time I'm, I'm presented with, uh, with a tree, but I can switch over to the visualizer and then I can really navigate in a, in a, in a, in a dare I say, fun way uh, uh, around the concepts, see the fingerprints, see the relationships, see information about the concepts that I've managed. Taxonomies, ontologies don't need to be this sophisticated. But the idea is if you put this much information into a taxonomy, you can leverage it everywhere. That's the idea in so many different situations in different ways. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to uh, Jim and Simon then. All right, uh, Simon, let's talk about, go back to this kind of dynamically driven term pages that you talked about earlier. Yeah, I think you're not showing your screen yet, uh, Jim. Oh, I seem to have lost my, uh, hold on a minute. There you go, you're back. I'm back, okay. All right, now you can see it. Next slide, uh, please. Put this back up. Good, here we go. So um, still on knowledge discovery, we're on to number five now. The next thing we'll look at is this concept of automated topic pages uh, using term-driven technology. And this is an, a SharePoint example. You can do similar things in other content platforms, but SharePoint makes it uh, particularly user-friendly uh, and rich to do it. Um, so you could have an intranet site. So, so the, the, what it means actually is an intranet page that's auto-populated, basically using queries based on the taxonomy term. So it's querying the term you've chosen for that page saying what content do we have on that term and let's display it in useful ways like you see here. So this is an example from the automotive industry again. This time it's just a general page about uh, the organization's knowledge on the automotive industry. And as you can see, without going into detail, you can see this provides a terrific shop window into your organization's best knowledge on a particular topic. So this is this kind of is the answer to the question, what do we know about the automotive industry? And that's particularly useful for newcomers to your organization who are trying to orient themselves or for people who are just changing roles into a new role and maybe a new department or moving to a specific project. So in all of those use cases, these kind of term-driven pages are incredibly helpful. Just to go through what's here, on the left you can see a topic navigation hierarchy which is based on the taxonomy. Uh, and then on the rest of the page, working from the top down, there's a static HTML piece, which is just for branding purposes. We've got a nice picture of the car and we could have some text about um, what we know about this topic. That's the manual part of it. And then the bottom half of the page is all auto-generated. So these are basically queries which combine the automotive industry and various content types, in this case, projects, specs, maintenance, suppliers, and training. Uh, so these are all dynamically generated lists, much like we saw for that um, restricted search example earlier on, only this case covering the whole scope of our knowledge uh, on automotive. Uh, in this case too, we're also, um, well, let me say that this is actually a terrific tool for curating uh, your knowledge as well as displaying it, because when you do this in a development environment for the first time, you often get a lot of stuff showing up on the pages that shouldn't really be there uh, because it's been wrongly tagged or just because it's not that important. So um, kind of the first iteration of doing this typically is a great opportunity for content curation. You can flag stuff that belongs on this page and then include that in your query. And you can check all your tagging and classification and make sure things aren't going wrong. Uh, in any aspect of that. So um, it's a great tool for end users, but it's also a great tool for content managers and it's all driven by the taxonomy. This can this can uh, basically bring content up through multiple subsites, through multiple libraries, a single library, so long as the metadata is applied appropriately, correct? 
Yep, the query is defined however you want to define it and whatever scope of um, stuff you wanted to query against, uh, you can define that in the, in, the, um, in the setup of the query. So it could be one repository, multiple repositories, single multiple libraries, lists, whatever you want it to be. So, so for those some, who are the SharePoint folks, you're not putting a library web parts on the site now. You're using a, a search query web part that's driving all this dynamically. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so there is some setup time in doing this. Uh, you have to figure out how you want to display things. You need some scripting for the tabs and so on and for the display. And you just need to organize your thinking about what, what are the use cases you want to prioritize and uh, how do you want to display it. So there is some setup time. But the great thing about this is once we've done this for the automotive industry, we can do it instantly for any other industry that we're dealing with or any other topic in our taxonomy. So um, once the page is developed once, uh, you just deploy it to all of the other terms that you want pages for uh, from your taxonomy. You probably don't want a page for everything, for every term you have, but, um, but you can do it for multiple terms in one shot. And, and I think as you'll see a little bit later when Jim does another demonstration, how you get that tag is interesting because you, you can auto-categorize content as it goes into SharePoint using the power of both the semantic model and the tool. Right. Uh, Jim, are so you going to speak about uh, chatbots? Uh, I, I'll do that and then Jim will do a demo on it. Um, so if you just go to the next slide. Um, yeah, the final aspect of discovery is uh, new kinds of user interface. And uh, there's growing use uh, within the enterprise of both chatbots and uh, increasingly Alexa and voice search as well. And they also rely on taxonomy typically in the same way because what you're doing is capturing user questions in their own language and then basically parsing that or mapping that onto your semantic model. So depending what question they asked, what terms does that remind you of in the taxonomy, including synonyms because typically they'll maybe call it something different to what you, you thought of it when you developed the main taxonomy. So um, by doing this, actually, you, you tend to enrich your model because you, you add synonyms and acronyms that you maybe hadn't thought of initially based on the user's questions. And then once you have it parsed into that framework, maybe topics and document types, then it's pretty easy then to use the technology we just looked at to query the repository and return the useful results based on that. So on the next slide, um, just a quick example of this and then Jim will show you this in live. Uh, just look at the top left here, the, the bottom one Jim will cover. But the top left is from Deloitte's um, public website so you can go and try this yourself. There's a tool called Scout uh, on there and I just asked Scout um, what do you know about uh, cognitive computing and healthcare? Uh, you can see that on the, on the right hand side of that little box. Um, and it wrote back to me, uh, I've got it, you're looking for examples related to cognitive computing, which is a topic in our taxonomy, and healthcare, which is an industry in our taxonomy. And here, here's what I found based on that. So it's a pretty simple query, but uh, it, it just shows um, how the taxonomy can leverage those kind of queries and shoot back uh, useful results. But let's look at this live. Jim has an example of this, and then I'll also let Jim talk about the remaining topics of fact extraction and, and workflow. Okay, great. Thank you, Simon. So yeah, that, that last um, couple slides were, were, were perfect introduction to this. Uh, when we, uh, in, you know, in a chatbot situation, you're really, the whole idea is, is mapping a person's intent, what they, what they use in natural language um, uh, to instantly to somebody's query. So this is a situation about a help desk. So you might have a, a technical uh, help desk that somebody's receiving calls or, or they're getting managing a, a chat interface and you need to immediately be able to direct people to the right materials. Uh, and you, your materials may be uh, how-to guides, uh, 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 engineering documents, etc., things like that. And and they're going to and they have to be already indexed, as we talked about. They need to be applied to the the right terminology so that they can be uh, easily found again. But that's only half the problem because you have to map the user's intention to those uh, 
those uh, concepts that are used to organize your repository of information. So in this case, I might have a problem with my application, or I just want to get some quick help. I may literally want to uh, talk to uh, someone or something. So if I just uh, click this and say, BSOD launching strata. So that enters the chat uh, information. And now what happens here is we're, we're passing this to the, to the taxonomy model and a specific utility of semaphore that allows you to instantly find out what they're actually, what these people are actually, what the person is actually asking for. And so what we get back is a specific product and a sp specific type of task starting in a specific symptom. We, we said BSOD launching strata. So we were, had to map that to these specific uh, product vectors, you might say. So these are a specific uh, 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 facets or vectors that can then go and find the specific information uh, that you're looking for. Uh, so that translation is the is the key part. Yeah, and, and on the screen you notice you've got a, a search query box there. Although you don't have it enabled, you could then hit a button to use those terms to search into the content sources. So now the call desk person has the right content. Yeah, periods here to get the different results. Um, so, uh, but next I want to move on to the topic of uh, push notification and, and, and getting relevant content uh, to users and um, and beyond that, what else can we do with uh, with taxonomy or ontologic or, or generally knowledge uh, models? So when you think about SharePoint has fantastic workflow uh, capabilities. You know, it, you can you can set up a workflow so if somebody adds a certain document or enters something into SharePoint, the right people are notified, or the, or the information is moved to the correct place, or or is presented in the correct information space. Uh, you know, very much like we were just seeing in the, in the previous um, uh, uh, slides that Simon and, and Jim were speaking to. How does that information get to those spaces where they're where it's needed to be seen? Well, SharePoint has a lot of capabilities for that, but it has to get through, uh, the, it has to have the metadata in order to move that content uh, correctly. So we'll see an example of that. Um, but sometimes the metadata that you need to move this content around isn't necessarily what the document is uh, you know, a, a about or the topics. It may be actually information that's explicit in the document. So let me get into information extraction. So I want to talk about that. Uh, a little bit. This, this is a use case we see a lot where people have a, a lot of documents and uh, in, in the data that they need to solve their problems or to do their analytics are in uh, documents. Now well, everything we've seen so far really talks about taking your taking your pile of documents or your content and saying what is it about? How do I get my user to find the right document? Here we're taking that a step further. We're saying we don't need, just need to find the document, we need to find the data in the document. So we're actually extracting data from documents and making it explicit. So we're, we're taking a, a bunch of uh, annual reports in this case and extracting the specific company, the jurisdiction, uh, the market value. So then we can actually do calculations and, and combine it with our structured databases or, or reconcile it with our, with our structured databases. We'll look at this a little more closely, where we have this 10K submission from a particular company to the uh, to the SEC, and we need to pull out the specific information into discrete data points that we can then use uh, for our analytics. Take it one step further. If we have a paragraph of text, we might want to find out uh, a, a set of uh, facts about it, the, the people involved in the company, the officers, and their role. Well, how do we do that? Well, we can find people's names because that's a type of entity. We don't need to model the people's name, the, 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 pe the names of people. Uh, that Barry Steele is the chief financial officer. We need to make that data explicit. We don't have, want to have to open the document to find that data. And one step further, 
we need to extract this the, the paragraph of text. So uh, being able to pull out this paragraph and I'm having trouble getting my screen to advance. There we go. So this is really useful like in contracts where you have a, a, you know, a huge number of contracts and you just need to pull out the important terms and conditions, the specific clauses that might put uh, the contract at risk or need to be specifically evaluated or need to be used in different in different cases. So how do you get that information out with, with information extraction? And the important point here is this is still model driven. We already, we know what roles are uh, often in an executive uh, board. We can model that so we can find that information and find the information that's in, that's in uh, association with it. So no, I think what Jim's about yeah. to show is very powerful. For those of you who've been around SharePoint as long as I have, what we're going to see is a little bit of that nirvana that people have always asked for, to tag content automatically, to understand what content is, and to do something with content. Now, because we've made content smarter, you'll see how this works. So, Jim, I'm looking forward to seeing it again, though I've seen it before. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. I'm... A little trouble make getting my screen to advance, but we'll make it work. Just switch to the trackpad. Okay, so here we are in uh, SharePoint, and we have a SharePoint library. Uh, probably for 90% of the people on this call are familiar with uh, SharePoint. And we're going to load some documents in it. And in that process, we're going to find out what uh, classification and information extraction can add to this process. I might add these two documents and everything looks fine. Uh, I need to check them in, of course, to get them to be recognized. Once they're checked in, I can open up this document library and see more of the metadata that's here. And we see that these uh, expense report and this resume, uh, nothing too secretive or, or, or special about these documents, but we've classified them specifically as expense reports uh, in this case, and we've extracted information. We haven't classified it, we've extracted specific information we, from the document. We may not know what companies are used in expense reports, but we can identify the company names and make them explicit as metadata. So then we can look across you know, all the expense reports that uh, involved uh, uh, Pizza Hut or, or whatever. We've also extracted people's names from the report. In the other case, we've extracted uh, uh, the record type of employee applications and resumes. Again, so this information is not uh, explicit in the document. We've We've categorized it as as such so that we can apply the right uh, schedule or retention schedule, et cetera, to it. And we've identified some concepts in this document as well. So now this information can be pushed to the right people, presented in the right interface. Let's take it one step further. What if we added uh, a document that has sensitive information in it that, that shouldn't be shown uh, in just a general uh, document library? So in this case, I'm going to go uh, get a document that happens to have some uh, personal information in it. And this is a good example of the workflow capabilities of Semaphore, or, I'm sorry, of SharePoint, of SharePoint if it has the right uh, metadata. So we've, um, we've added this document but some of, uh, SharePoint is going to look at this document, identify uh, uh, some of the metadata that's been added, and you'll see now that it's gone. 
So I may have added this to the wrong document library where it's a sensitive information should not be loaded into a, uh, a public um, uh, directory uh, or a library like this. So it's so, so we've set up a workflow to look for specific metadata to move it. So if we go to a different library, we'll actually see that document over here. We see here it is that it, where it was just added. And why did it move? Well, it's because Semaphore has added explicit metadata. We've identified it as personnel files. We've identified it with a specific security level of PII for personal identifiable information. And that triggered the workflow uh, to move it to this other location. Can't happen without the right metadata. And the best way to apply the metadata is with a, consistently and continuously uh, is, is with an engine like, uh, uh, like Semaphore that can add that metadata that's needed to drive the right experience. And uh, I know CGI and I know do a lot of work with SharePoint, and so do we. That's why we often end up on projects together. So it's uh, uh, it's been uh, it's it's been a great uh, sharing this uh, webinar uh, uh, with uh, with Jim and Simon. If you can go back to the slides. Yep. So you know you, you've heard a lot today, and 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 some of it's kind of it's kind of scientific and. Some of it's not, but basically what you what I'm hoping we, we were hoping you get out of this is the idea that if you have a semantic model, if you develop that, and you use a tool like Semaphore to hold that and manage that and the strength of the relationships, now all of a sudden you've got this this way to describe knowledge. It's so much more powerful than you had before. And then when you bring it into tools, whether it's SharePoint or other tools. You can now use that to do what we showed in the, in the eight use cases. Now, also think about artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotic processing. All of those can also take advantage of this semantic model, uh, which is really powerful because it makes them much more powerful much more quickly. So essentially, that's what we wanted to go over today, the art of the possible. And, and I thought, think you see dynamically generated pages and chatbots and frankly I love the automated tagging in SharePoint that's the biggest complaint I've heard for 17 years of doing SharePoint work <laughs> so for Simon and Jim and, and Michael and, and Ann and the folks everybody at CGI and I know and smart logic thank you very much I don't know if we have any questions or not I'll turn it back over to Ann I believe this has been recorded so you can review it later as well Ann Thank you, Jim. And yes, we do have some questions. Um, so I'm going to start with the first one. And I think this one, um, this one was, uh, the, this question came in a little bit earlier in the presentation, and it was when Simon was talking about the search widgets and facets. And the question is, are the dynamically generated search facets based on graph edges? Simon? So it could, I could jump, like jump in there. Actually, that's, um, uh, to, so it could, it could be, and it all depends on how you write your, um, um, your algorithms to do that, right? So if, for example, if you have, if you're searching for a disease and, and there's an edge to different compound, chemical compounds, it can search, it can surface those results are completely unknown to the user that that not knowledge was there. So, um, so absolutely. So edges are a, a, a huge part of how you build your algorithms and how you want your relationships to play in the actual search results. I don't know if that, I hope that answered your, the question. Thank you, Michael. Um, and then another question is, can you use an ontology in data analytics? Yes. Um, Definitely. I think that's what Jim was uh, demonstrating towards the end there, where he was looking at uh, extracting sales and product information. Do you want to say a bit more about that, Jim Morris? Sure. Uh, yeah, exactly right. Uh, the, the the data that you need to do analytics, uh, often it's you, you have a lot of uh, structured data, financial data, uh, scientific data stored in databases. but Often the missing pieces is data that is locked in documents. Some people would say tell you that 80% of the data that people need to do the right analytics and 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 uh, answer the right questions is actually locked in documents. 
and the only way to get it out is to actually uh, you know open each document and 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 data entry that, of what's in it into another system and that's uh those are the use cases we run into all the time and so semaphore is uh is being used to not just model yeah uh topical uh, type uh, taxonomies or, or knowledge models, but we're actually modeling facts and, and how those facts can be extracted uh, from documents. So then making that data explicit then allows you to do the type of uh, computations and analytics uh, that you need to do. And, and I think the, the, the coolest thing is when you're combining data you've extracted from documents with these uh, knowledge models that tell you that um, uh, that this uh, drug is approved for this disease. You know that. That's a that's a fact that you know you've modeled in your business, and and you're trying to re and you use that in conjunction with with the specific data points that you've extracted from uh, documents that might uh, challenge that fact or uh, might provide more specifics. Like uh, this drug was uh, um, uh, given to this patient uh, to, to, for this particular indication. That's a fact that you wouldn't necessarily model. But you've extracted from your documents and and, and amended it with the uh, knowledge model that you've that you've built. Okay, I have another question here. What are the trade-offs between using public models versus developing your own in-house? Um, I'll start this, and then I'll turn it over to Michael or uh, Simon, who've done this more. But public models uh, are good for starters. Um, developing something from scratch in-house is generally not a good idea for developing a taxonomy, but the, but the, but the public models are starters. Um, Michael, Simon, why don't you guys expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, so just to keep it base, so an ontology is, is really just a codification of what we know, right? It's how, how we, how we modeling our a knowledge space which is in our heads into some sort of format that a computer can then take to make sense of of textual co content um so if i were to ask you that then then um you know sorry jim to pick on you if i were to say hey jim what do you know about cars you'll say well sure just look up you know there's a standard out there to tell you all the makes and models of cars out there so let's start with that and then, you know, rather than uh, repeat all this work, there's stuff out there. Let's start with that and then augment it and enrich it for what we need it for. So that's the kind of approach. You don't have to start from scratch. Uh, taxonomies, there a lot of mature taxonomies are out there. You avoid a lot of headache. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of wealth of stuff. So the recommendation is is to understand your domains um, and start with public ontologies, which is probably about 95%, strip it, slim it, and then enrich it uh, for your environment. That's what the recommendation would be. Okay, Jim, did you, Jim Morris, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think uh, Michael okay. did a great job of summing that up. Okay. Um, well, that's all the questions we have. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, and as I indicated at the beginning, um, you will all be receiving the playback information within one day from the close of this webinar. And um, thank you again to uh, to Jim and Michael and Simon, our partners, for um, for helping us uh, on this webinar and for, part for for participating, and we look forward to seeing you all at another Smart Logic webinar. Have a great day.